Hey, hey, everybody, welcome on into the studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and we are doing Clay Share Live tonight, like we do every Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. For those who are wondering what Eastern Time means, if you're not in the U.S., Eastern Time is the same as New York Time, so if you want to know when to find us, we're on the same time as New York is, if that's helpful. So tonight we're going to be glazing heart plates. A, well, this is actually a, a class that has been over a year in the making. <laughs> Couldn't wait to make that joke. Because last year we made these heart That's plates. Helpful. So tonight we're so going to be glazing heart plates. Yet, you can go watch the heart plate tutorial. We made a couple of them. Here they are. And we didn't use any forms or any templates. We used a candy box. That's right. We used a cardboard candy box to make these lovelies right here. So you can check that out and I show you how to make plates without having any forms. Now I love GR pottery forms, I love cutters, I love all that stuff, but there's other ways to make stuff. There's always other ways to make stuff. So this class is there and I still haven't glazed them so they've been in the studio for a year. So we got those to do. We also have a whole bunch, I got stacks of them, of these little little dinner plates, flat plates, candy plates, whatever you want to do with them, heart-shaped plates that we can glaze. We'll see how many we can get done uh, in the course of this evening. So, hi, Krista, I'm glad you're here. First time you've been watching in months. Glad you made it. It's gonna be fun tonight. So, I've got some test tiles here from, uh, well, I was testing out a different clay than we're using right now, but it's very similar to B-Mix. This is with the um, Smooth Speckle, Smooth Stone Speck from Tucker's Clay, and it's a little browner, barely. Like, when we look at it, it's got, it's a little more of a cream, and it's got little specks in it. So it's a nice speckled clay, but it's the similar glaze results. And I've got a bunch of glaze options so I can see how they flow and melt and how they work with texture and everything. So we're gonna be using these as guides to pick colors to glaze our plates with. So it's gonna be really, really, really fun. So I am live on the ClayShare app, which you can watch on your iPhone or Android device tablets, whatever, phones. Um, you can watch it on Amazon Fire Stick. You can watch it on your Roku, on Apple TV. You can be watching us on ClayShare.com. You can be watching us on Instagram. You can be watching us on Facebook and my YouTube channel. So there's a lot of places you could be watching us all at. So what I'm going to do right now is pull the Instagram folks down so they can see more detail. So you guys are going to get their phone in the way for a little while. Um, but I think we're going to be scooching over to the overhead in a minute anyhow, since we're going to actually be doing glaze stuff. So, alrighty. So, heart plates. What are we going to glaze them? And I'm going to tell you right now, just because they are heart plates, you do not have to glaze these red. Absolutely not. Hearts are for more than Valentine's Day. You know, if you want to avoid that Valentine's Day cliche, don't glaze them red right? Glaze them another color. But there's nothing wrong with red glazes. So I'm just putting it out there because I know there's a lot of folks who are concerned about missing Valentine's Day and their hearts being um, like stale maybe because they, they because that, the holiday's over. But that's not a thing you have to worry about at all. I don't think so. And so Jan is a new member and she's loving the programs. Uh, all this tech can be challenging. You want to respect our format. When is the best place for asking general questions? You can ask here if you want to. There are, are there Saturday and Sunday broadcasts? We have three broadcasts per week on ClayShare that are live in addition to the new full length classes we put up at least twice a month. And those broadcasts are Monday mornings at 9 a.m. is Good Morning Clay Share. That's a technical chat. We share um, things about glazes, kilns, anything technical pottery related or clay share news. We don't really do tutorials in that. And it's a great chance for you to come and find out um, all that's happening in clay share. And if you have any questions at all, that's a great place to ask. It's also um, where we kind of address how to use ClayShare and get the most out of your membership. So that's Good Morning ClayShare on Monday mornings. All times are Eastern, by the way. 
And then we do Wednesdays at 5 p.m., which is Clay Share Live. That's our free public tutorial broadcast we do to the world, and it's free to everybody. And then at 6.15 p.m. Eastern, that's Clay Share Primetime, which is the private broadcast we do just for premium members of Clay Share. So that's all we do for broadcasts. I don't do weekends. I take weekends off now. Just started doing that a couple weeks ago after many, many years, finally taking some weekends off. I do end up working a lot, but um, I try to take weekends off. <laughs> so there you go. So I'm going to prep my pieces because this piece right here has been sitting in the studio for a year. It's a bit dusty. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of it. Just going to wipe it down and get any of that dust off it. Now, you can dip and pour these with dip and pour glazes. You can use brush on glazes. All of my dip and pour glazes um, are in big five gallon buckets and we're not going to do a tutorial for that tonight. We will be doing some of those during Clay Share Con, which Clay Share Con starts in two weeks. It starts. And I cannot believe it's already here. Wait, am I hearing people say, what's Clay Share Con? I am so glad you asked. Clay Share Con is a five day online clay conference. It is free, it is open to the public. It starts Wednesday, February 23rd at, I believe, 9.30 a.m. and goes all the way to Sunday, February 27th at 4 p.m. We have demos and tutorials all day. We have Amico, we have Brent, we have Mako, we have JR Pottery Forms, we have Speedball, we have Michael Harbridge, we've got me, Diamond Core Tools, Sam Bao Studios, we have Hot Kilns, which is L&L Kilns, uh, so many things, and you can check out the full schedule on claysharecon.com. We also have that on claysharesources.com. Yeah. So, all right, so I'm just cleaning up these pieces here, and I already know what I'm going to glaze this. This is, this is easy, this one here. But this one is the one we're going to add some texture. We're going to do a different color on the rim. Do I have a sample of my cobblestone? Karen wants to know. Absolutely. Here. Which camera are we on? Uh, where do we go? I don't know. Where are you? Well, right now I'm on the front. I thought you were on the overhead because that's where I'm pointing everything. Oh, where's the camera? Hold on. I need you to, I can't. <laughs> if this is your first time watching, it doesn't usually happen like this, but I can't see what is happening on the camera because the view uh, finder thing's not flipped up. So I don't know what you guys are seeing. Sorry. <laughs> I can show Instagram though. There's my cobblestone. <laughs> I can put it up there. Can you see it? I don't know. Um, is this a flip up or flip side? Oh. Okay, well I can't reach that then. So forget that, I'm not going to do it. But here's cobblestone. Um, but what we're going to do this right here, I'm thinking, I know I just made this big spiel about don't do red for Valentine's, but I'm going to do red for the texture and then I'm going to do another color on top of it. So here's Snapdragon from Amico, which is a really lovely celadon, and it's really great for texture. I'm going to use it a little differently than you might normally use it. I'm going to use it to fill in all my texture and then wipe away the excess. Then I'm going to put another color on top of it. So it's going to be a red on, I'm either going to do uh, cherry blossom, the red with the pink, or I'm going to go ahead and do the weeping plum. I'm not sure yet. I'm still working that part out. <sighs> Oh, you folks are sharing the link. Thank you, thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we're going to put this to the side. We're going to come back to that one. Now, this piece here is Laguna B-Mix 5. It's just a smooth mid-range stoneware clay. No grog or anything in it. Uh, Bis fired to cone 05, and now it's ready to go. And then this is the Amico Snapdragon Celadon. We're going to have three Amico tutorials during Clay Share Con. Yeah, and one Brent tutorial, a Brent wheel tutorial, or a maintenance uh, demo. But they're gonna do some cool stuff with glazing and silk screens and all, all kinds of good stuff. It's gonna be great, yes. And Clay Share Con, you know, we have that, and then after Clay Share Con ends, 
I know we can't even imagine it ending because it's so amazing. We have a two-part workshop starting with Adam Field the following Saturday. And then in April, we're going to have a crystalline glaze workshop with Andy Boswell, the Kaolin Tiger. So that's exciting as well. So we have lots of workshops coming up after ClayShareCon that you can sign up for on ClayShare.com. So much awesomeness. So I'm putting this on, getting it down in all that texture. Now you could have gone a different way and we could have gone with like a deep purple in the texture with red on the entire thing, right? That would look nice. I wonder how this would be with like a Chun Plum um, in the center and red on the, I don't know, right? A red on the edges, that could be, that could be pretty amazing too. Weeping Plum, you want Weeping Plum with red? Um, let's see how my jar is. Another red other than Snapdragon. Yeah, Clayscapes has a red hook, it's called. It's really beautiful. You could always use Stroke and Coats. They have a red called Hot Tamale, which is really beautiful too. You could also do a similar technique if you use Speedball under, Red Underglaze or any company's Red Underglaze to fill in. So don't have to use a red glaze, um, but it's... It's kind of nice. So the question I have with Weeping Plum when we do this technique is will we still see the red because Weeping Plum is really dark but I think the red is darker. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind whenever you do a staining technique you want to make sure whatever you're staining shows through. So the stain ideally should be darker than the piece whatever glaze you're going to put on top. So you can always do a clear, right? But I think a clear on this would be very boring. Now you could do a very sweet cream color if you had something like eggshell wash. You could put that over it so you'd have a sweet wash finish. And that's a Georgie's glaze, the eggshell wash. And I do like that one a lot. You remember we made these? You can't believe it's been a year. I know. And these are still one of my favorite ways of building because I can take, you know, you just take the cover of the heart chocolate box or, or the bottom, so you get two templates in one, right? And you just take that and that's all you need to make a plate. So when I'm teaching, sometimes I'm limited with what I can bring if I'm teaching an in-person workshop or I have students that, um, you know, can't get the things that I always have or the things that are always readily available for us here in the U.S. And it's a great way for them to learn. Also, it's a good way to familiarize yourself with the material. You know, using cutters and forms are wonderful and I do love them and I will never stop using them or supporting companies that make them. But when you're starting out, you need to learn the material, how it behaves, you know, what it can do and how to work with it. And making a plate like this where you're not relying on anything at all except your skill which you're building if you're just starting. We're all building skill. So don't think that you don't have a skill just because you're starting, you do. You're building it up. And so using something like just that shape to cut your heart out of a slab of clay, and then we make our foot, right? And then we shape it. And we did this with no forms at all. So uh, it's a really, really great, great way to build. And now I have a class on clay share. If you don't want to make the heart plate, which is available, um, and it's the skinny olive tray. So if you've done that class, it's a similar way to build, and it's a, a good way because you're really reliant on your own skill. All right, so we've got red in here, and it has sort of an antique finish because we've wiped away the excess, so it's only filled in where we've stamped. And this texture that's on here is a stamp that I carved by hand, um, in my, in one of my making a stamp classes, I show you how to carve your own stamps and it's a really great way to make very unique, one-of-a-kind textures. You just looked up the class and gonna watch it. You like working outside the box, <laughs> outside the chocolate box. <laughs> so I'm just making sure I've got all of this off. 
So now we have it stained and ready to go. Uh, weeping plum was suggested, and I have weeping plum. I'm not opposed to using it. There's not a lot of movement in the celadon glazes. This will just be a very simple plum color. So what I think we're going to do is uh, mix it up a little bit. Weeping plum is nice. Yes. There's another plum that Amico makes, and that's called Chun Plum, which is one of my favorite. This is the Chun Plum right here. Let me grab my sample of Weeping Plum. And this is Weeping Plum. So we have a couple different plums. So what if we do Weeping Plum here over the red, right, on the rim? And then where the dish, the bowl part of the dish starts, we do Chun Plum. That way we've got three different glazes. The Chun Plum has movement in it. It has um, a little more visual interest. So I, th I think we're going to do that. And we'll see where we end up. Who knows? Who knows, right? Oh, Krista, I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you're able to watch with us. All right, so once we put the weeping plum on top of the border, we're not going to be able to go back in and wipe off any areas. So this is your last chance to go in with your sponge and really clean it up. Wherever you have that other glaze, which it, here I use the Snapdragon, whether you use that or something else, you're not going to be able to go back in and remove any of it. So now's your chance. All right, weeping plum right here. And I'm just going to apply it right on the rim. And this is a glaze the Celadons really like three coats. Although, I think we could probably do two considering we have that wiped back stained version of the Snapdragon. So when I say stained, we treat it like a stain, right? Whenever you apply a glaze or a pigment, an oxide, or, or anything like that, and you wipe it back, you're treating it like a stain because you're staining the surface with that color. Now we don't have to be concerned about putting layers of the weeping plum on top of the Snapdragon for food safety issues because there's nothing in these Celadon, in these Amico Celadon glazes that are an issue. So I know that's always a question people ask, well, is it okay? But I'm going to tell you all of the Amico Celadons are fine. They have nothing in them that you have to worry about. The colorants are made with mason stains and those are food safe. So you don't have to worry about it. And you might have seen I just put a little water inside my jar because the glaze was a little thick. And you might have noticed that it came out really gummy. So let's take a look at the back. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the back and the weeping plum as well, right around here. So we're just going to go ahead and put that on. Now the brush I'm using is a Sumi, S-U-M-I brush. It's often used for calligraphy. And they're great brushes for applying glaze. They hold a lot of glaze. You can get them to come to a really fine point. And they are like one of my faves. I also love fan brushes and hake brushes, but for this we're using the sumi because we need to be very precise in our application. You love the texture, Regina? I think, do I talk, in the class where we make this, I think I talk about it and I might even show them in one of my stamp making classes. But it was just, I made the stamp out of clay, drew the pattern on it with a pencil and then just carved it. So we're going to do back to back two coats of this weeping plum. And I'm not going to worry about glazing in here. The clay will vitrify. It doesn't need to be glazed, although it can be. That's a personal choice. I've signed it in there with speedball underglaze that I've done scraffito on. That's how I carved my name in there. And you know, this glaze would still show the name, but it would be cloudy. 
So if I put any glaze in there, it would be, I would probably go with a lighter color. The cherry blossom, maybe. Okay, let's flip it back over. And now let's make sure we have the edges. What number is the Sumi brush? Um, it doesn't have a number. This would be a medium. Sometimes companies will put numbers on their Sumi brushes. A lot of times they don't. Um, you know, when you look, this one would be considered large. There's no number. This one would be a medium. This one would be more of a small. I don't know if you can see the difference. With it being dry, you can't get wet. Actually, I think my small one is this one here. So I don't know if that helps. You can see a little bit. But what I do is I get various sizes. Often I will buy them from school supply companies and I'll buy teacher packs because, yes, they are an investment of about $100, but I'll end up getting like 80 brushes. And the last time I bought them, I got them from Blick, but they sold out. They do not have them anymore. Um, I think NASCO might have them. Amazon might have sets. So if you're looking for a big batch of brushes, you know, they're not the highest quality brushes. And, and that's okay. I don't expect them to. They're not going to last forever. Just need them to work for a little while, you know, three, four months, and then, you know, they kind of fall apart. That's why you get a big pack. Don't buy expensive brushes for glazing. The ceramic material, it's really hard on the bristles. They just don't last. It's not like painting. It's a, it's a different medium. So, you know, painting, we buy really nice brushes. We take excellent care of them. You should, still should take good care of your studio brushes for ceramics, but it's not the same. It's not the same thing at all. All right, so we got two coats of Weeping Plum. And I think that's where we're going to stop with the Weeping Plum for now. For now. We'll, we'll see where it, we'll see. We'll see. And then let me get the Chun Plum. Oh, but then there's Smoky Merlot. Oh, guys. Then we have Smoky Merlot. All right. Well, let's see. Where's my Smoky Merlot sample? All right. <laughs> I didn't mean. Okay. So we have Snapdragon Red, which is what we put into the recessed areas, right? That's this beautiful red. We wiped it back. So we're going to have red there. Then we put Weeping Plum on top of that red. So that red will pop out. They're close. I think the red will still show. I think it'll work. And then for the body, the center, we could go with this beautiful Smoky Merlot or the Chun Plum. I, I think the Chun Plum. I think with the red, this would be the color palette right here. So this is a nice thing when you're picking out glazes to have test tiles so you can create color palettes. Here I have Snapdragon, Weeping Plum, Chun Plum. Now I could switch it up and try it with the purple, but I think the Smoky Merlot is great, but I think we'll go with the Chun Plum. Smoky Merlot, rose gold, Georgie's, oh no, that's for the next piece. You're just getting ahead of me. Shh, you're ahead of me. <laughs> this is the rose gold right here, and we're going to do that on the next piece. So Susan, you, <laughs> you know me well. That's next. We're going to do that on the next one. Um, and so you guys are wanting Smoky Merlot. <laughs> all right well I'll let you guys pick you can tell me now you know do you want to see Chun Plum or Smoky Merlot Chun Plum Smoky Merlot you can just say Plum Merlot I'll know what you mean and uh, the first grouping like if that people answer like the first batch of answers I get I'll go with my Smoky Merlot looks really blue I think it's the clay it's on because it's on that Tucker's Smooth Stone Speck, and I don't know, do I have a Smoky Merlot on anything else nearby? I do. Hold on. Let me grab it. Sorry. Got to walk off. Got to walk off the stage, but not in a huff. Here's Smoky Merlot on B-Mix. Here's Smoky Merlot on the Tucker's. So this test tile is Tucker's, but this is B-Mix. So... It changes because we're working with B-Mix right now. So we have, I mean, 
Oh, wow. Plum. Pink opal from Mako. Oh, don't. Do I have pink opal? Let me look. I do have pink opal. That, that totally changes everything. Let's, I, I tell you, I have a lot of plates. If we wait, we can do more combos. <laughs> plum, 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 plum. All right, we're going to go with plum for this one, but I'm keeping Smoky Merlot out because we'll do something with it. So this is, uh, I should do this every time I have to glaze. I should do a broadcast and you guys can tell me what. This is all the Chun Plum I have left. It's a little sad because there's glaze shortages happening. And I worry, but you know, if my favorite glazes run out, I will just find subs. Besides, I can always make my, I can make my own glazes and I know Clayscape's pottery is not running out anytime soon. They're gonna have four new glazes coming out. You knew I had to plug it, right? You know I had to, sh and two of them are mine. That's right. I have a line of glazes that Clayscape's Pottery makes and sells. We already have six of my colors out you can buy, and I've got two more joining my line, and they are Black Copper, which is a glaze that I've been making for almost 20 years and using. It's amazing. They are food safe and dinnerware safe. And then my nutmeg, which is another one I've been making for almost 20 years. So these aren't glazes that just like, you know, got invented. They've, they've been used many, many times on many pieces. So we don't have any overlapping really. It's just right at the edge. So again, if I was using a glaze that I was concerned about putting too many layers on and the food safety, we're avoiding that because we're not overlapping. We're really just creating bands. And I bet I could get somebody to grab me my black copper and my nutmeg to share with you all so you can actually see what they look like. Grab the mug and the teapot. Yeah, you all know it's Kevin. He's going to grab it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my studio assistant is Kevin. <laughs> You're on the wait list for next week for all of your favorites from Mako. Oh, I know. And one is violet, yes. So in making samples, how many coats do I apply? I do three. Three coats. Uh, thank you. So this is my black copper. I shared a bit of this Monday morning. And then this is my nutmeg right here. And so my black copper is a true metallic copper, um, food safe, dishwasher safe, microwave safe, all that stuff. Layers amazingly, but by itself it's great too. And you'll be able to get this. I know there's some difficulty getting copper glazes, but not this one. You'll be able to get that at the end of the month during ClayShare Con for ClayShare members and then everybody else the very beginning of March. And then this is my nutmeg. I'll take the lid off so you can see. I don't have to worry about dropping it. So you can see how that looks. And then where it's thinner, it goes more warm and toasty. And on dark clay, it goes warmer and toastier. It's amazing. It's amazing on dark clay. Like um, any of the darker brown clays, not super dark like chocolate clays, just, just dark, just like a Laguna 75. All right, we're gonna put our last coat of the Chun Plum on, and then we're gonna move on to the next piece because I, I want to load my kiln tomorrow so we can have a kiln opening on, sa on Sunday. And if things work out, I'll have some new samples of my nutmeg and my black copper in that kiln opening and maybe the new violet, the ultraviolet, and the new charcoal from Clayscapes Pottery. And if you want to see their new glazes, go to Clayscapes Pottery's Facebook page and, or Instagram page and you can see it there. All right, so here is the plate drying. Little, little shiny because it's wet. So we're going to sit that to the side and we're going to work on another piece. So let's just sit that over here. And speaking about staining, I just wanted to show this as an example. So this is all under glazes with a clear glaze on top. But I started with yellow under glaze from Speedball, and then I used their saffron, then I used their mandarin orange, then I used their flame, 
and then I used their carmine on the very rim and I wiped it all back. So I applied them all first, wiped them all back, and then put clear on top. And I might do that with a piece here. We'll see, we'll see. All right, so the next one is this one. And it's a big one and I have a ton of plates so we can do just one color. You don't have to do a ton of colors if you don't want to, but it does make it more interesting. And we're gonna do Georgie's rose gold on this one. So let me grab that. I didn't grab them out to begin with. And we'll see how this is. So this is one of my glazes that froze. And I was hoping we would get to use one. I mixed a bunch of them up, but there's no way I did all 203. I counted my jars. So everybody, <laughs> I counted the jars of glaze that I have in the studio. And I have 203 jars of glaze, which is a lot. So this is one of the ones that froze and I didn't mix them all up. I only mixed the ones I was using the day I was glazing when I shared that little video on social media last week. But even if it hadn't froze, a great way to mix up your glazes is with a stick blender right here. And this has two speeds, low, high, and you just put it in. Now just, just keep in mind this could splat. I'll try to go slow. A little tip is do not pull it out of the glaze with it running. Just, you know, and then tap off the glaze that's on it. And then I put it in my water and just turn it on again. And now it's clean. And if any gets up on the barrel or the mixing end, I just go ahead and wipe it off. Just like that. So it's easy. I actually usually have this guy, but it's full of, this was, it's full of dirty. This guy is great for cleaning it because it can really get down in, but I've been glazing and it's full of glazy water. So we're not gonna use it. Not right now. So we'll put this to the side because we might need it again. And now my glaze is all mixed up. And let's go ahead and use the fan brush since I was talking about using them. Since we used one kind, let's use another kind. These are Mako fan brushes. And I've got a couple. Uh, this little one is a number four. This one's a number eight. And I'm just, I like to get them wet before I put them in the glaze. Just squeeze them out after you get them wet. Madeline, yes, you have a good question. Do I wipe my bisqueware before glazing? I did that at the very beginning and you must have missed it, but yes, I do. I always wipe my bisqueware with a damp, clean, damp sponge so that any dust or particles that are on there will come off and I don't have to worry about contaminating my glaze with it. Also, you don't want little burrs or bits of bisque caught up in your glaze. All right, so this has a very uh, small, small side. It has a big bottom, small side. So if you want to glaze here, you can. You don't have to. You can just glaze the rim and the front for plates like this. So I'm just going to take my fan brush, wipe off the back. That's just to keep it from dripping too much. And then starting in the middle, going back and forth so that I can really get it in. I just brush it around. Now, do you see the, the consistency of this glaze? See how creamy it is? This is the consistency you want it to be. It's like thin pudding. If your glaze is thicker than that, add a tiny bit of water. If it's thinner, you can just apply an extra coat. And then for the edge, just going to take the fan brush and you just kind of pounce it on and pull up.
Now if you want to do, if you want to do the back, let's do the back. Let's do it. I wasn't gonna, but let's. It's a big plate. It deserves to have the back done, right? Let me clean my work table. If you have any dust at all on the bisque, will it repel the glaze? Not always, but often, yes. And that's one of the reasons why we get crawling. If you have any oils, any dust, um, any waxes or anything on the surface, it will repel the glaze often and can cause crawling. So ideally you want to clear all that stuff off, yeah. All right, I want to flip this over. There we go. Using the same brush, we're just going to use the edge of it. And I'm going to stop within a quarter of an inch of the bottom. You could wax your bottom if you want to so that you don't have to worry about glaze getting on it. But usually when I do brush on glazes, I don't wax the bottoms. It's usually only when I'm doing dipping and pouring do I wax them. And sometimes I'll just go ahead and wax all my pieces when they come out of the bisque. I just set them on the table and I'll wax them just because I'm, you know, started out only using dip and pour glazes in my pottery career, so it's still part of my habit. But lately, I've been, I've been doing better about just sitting them on shelves, not waxing them until I know I'm actually going to use a dip and pour glaze. So just dragging the brush along. The Sumi brush would do this so well, but this one works. So we got a coat. That's enough. Now before these go in the kiln, before I load any glaze pieces in the kiln, I always check the bottoms and wipe them to make sure there's no glaze on them. So even though there's none on it now, I, it could get set somewhere and get some on it. So yeah, I will go ahead and make sure I check that bottom. All right, second coat. And I think I'm only going to put two coats of the rose gold on. It's funny, when I first got this glaze, I was like, meh about it. I uh, made some bird pocket magnets with it, and I was just not over the moon for it. And then this past summer, I was doing some tests, and I grabbed it, and I was like, I haven't. This is the same jar I got like three years ago. So... I've been working out of the same jar for three years. I felt like I needed to give it a little more of a chance. So I started doing some tests with it, and it turns out it's one of my favorites. There. If your glaze is too thick and you have highly textured areas, what can happen is that glaze won't sit down in, it won't sink down into the texture, and you'll get little, not pinholes, but little places that don't have glaze. So if you find that's happening on your pieces, you might want to thin your glaze down a tiny bit. We did that, we talked about that a lot in my last glazing tutorial that we did live. All right, so here we have this. Should we do, should we do one with staining in wiping back? I think we should. I've got this big one here. And I think that could do it well. I also have one over there with roses. Oh, we wanted to do a smoky Merlot. Let's do a, the roses with smoky Merlot. And we'll come back. Sandy needs to know how to refresh the comments. Sandy, go to the top of the page and just click the refresh button. And that will refresh the comments for you. If you're on the app, swipe down. Oh, great. Any chance of getting some light flux on the rims tonight? Oh, Lisa. There's glazing with a chance of flux. There's always a chance for flux. Um, as a matter of fact, my dear, I'm saving this one because it has a great big rim, and I think some flux is in order. So we're going to have to do something with this. But... I don't, I don't know what yet. All right, so this is the one we're going to do the Smoky Merlot right here. You hope the glaze stirring thing is battery powered and not plugged in if you're going to put it in water. No, it is plugged in, but it's meant to go in water. It's meant to go in liquid. It's all good. We're, just don't take it in the bath, you know. You can put it in water to clean it, but please do not take it in your bath. 
No, do, yes. Did you all hear him? He said no DIY jacuzzi. It's not for making a, <laughs> a home hot tub. <laughs> When do I recommend adding gum solution? I rarely add gum solution um, to my glazes. If I'm using a dip and pour glaze and I want to make it more brushable, you can add gum solution then. But normally I just mix it really well and you'd be surprised what that does to get it to a nice brushability. Yeah, I, but again, there is zero wrong with adding gum solution to your glazes. So if you find that you're having a hard time getting them to brush, by all means, add a little gum solution. Start with the teeniest, tiniest bit, like a quarter of a teaspoon, eighth of a teaspoon, a fraction. You don't want much at all. All right, so that's the outside. Oh, I know, we need to use some Laguna. Um, yeah, I know what we're gonna do with the love one. And I know it says love, but I don't think I'm gonna make it a red love color. I think I'm gonna make it blue. I think I'm gonna use the Laguna Peacock. Black for the stained black on the inner area, Laguna Peacock, and then um, flux on the rim. You can have blue love plates, especially if you're giving it to someone who loves blue, right? So that's one heavy coat of Smoky Merlot, but I'm gonna do another. How many coats of nutmeg did I use? This was dipped and uh, dip and pour applied. I would do two coats of nutmeg if I was brushing it, and you'll get the darker colors. If you do three coats, you'll probably get the lighter. So do you see, it breaks so amazing on texture. It just, it's really nice. Um, we're gonna play with that more when we get into Clay Share Con. I am trying to hold back because I don't want everybody to get so excited because you can't buy it yet, because it's not out. But I'm hoping to have a few pieces in the kiln just to, just to show you, and then we'll work with it during Clay Share Con and after, and we'll do combos and stuff and um, different ways to apply it and everything. All right, so I went ahead and put the second coat of the Smoky Merlot on. Really, I think two coats We'll do it for this. So we're just gonna sit this to the side. I'm like, where can I put it? There we go. All right, so we put that one over there and let's do the flux one. Let's have some flux. Right here, it says love inside. So I'm gonna use black under glaze and I'm just gonna use speed balls. Now you could use Amico's Obsidian Celadon for your black or Mako's Tuxedo Stroke and Coat if you don't have Speedball Black or Mako has black under glazes. Um, Amico has black under glazes. There's a ton of companies that have black under glazes. So any black under glaze will do for what we're gonna do. What happens with too much gum solution? You start diluting the glaze, right? And so you don't get as thick of a glaze application. And you can run into problems with it being too thin. So start thinner. Always less is more. All right, so we're gonna use this as a stain. Look at how thick that is. That is not gonna work. So we're gonna thin it down in the jar. You love Smoky Merlot. Looks great over Mako Pink Opal. Have I, did I do that on a cup a couple years ago? I think I did. I also like the Smoky Merlot with Lavender Mist. If you haven't tried it that way, Therese, you might love that. Yeah, if you're a fan of the, that, that, that look, I think you'll like it. Also, uh, Smoky Merlot looks great with dark flux. All right, that's still too thick. Do you see how it's not a stain, it's more gummy? So we need to get this to be a stain, like a wash. That's better. See how it kind of washes on? Because we're gonna have to wipe away all the excess, and I don't wanna make more work for myself. So we don't have a giveaway tonight because Clay Share Con, usually we give away about 80 prizes. I know, 80 prizes is crazy. So we just do it then, I know. And the great thing about Clay Share Con is we have some fabulous sponsors doing great promos that they only do during Clay Share Con. 
and uh, great giveaways too. And you don't have to pay anything to be entered in the giveaways. Just go to clayshare.com, sign up for our email list. Do not unsubscribe because if you unsubscribe from our email list, you will no longer be entered. Premium members of Clayshare do not have to worry because you're automatically entered always. All right, you put on your, so we put on the black underglaze, but if I was doing a pigment, like I shared my little Cardinal and Birch's mug that I did with Georgie's autumn foliage pigment, anytime we're using a material as a stain, like we did on the rim of the heart plate, no matter what it is, you're just gonna brush it on and wipe back. So if I put that pigment on, if I put the underglaze on, if I put another glaze on, and I'm gonna treat it like a stain, you just wait until it's no longer shiny, so you don't have to wait very long, and then you start wiping it away. Smoky Merlot under Chun Plum, my two faves, Sandra. Those are two faves. I haven't tried them together. All right, gonna have to. So I am wiping back, and maybe I should pull my my once clean bucket of water. Yeah, yeah, this is what happens. Discount offers are a free gift for everyone. They are, they are. Our sponsors are so generous with everybody to do this. Use gum solution distilled water to thin thick, thick glazes just a little bit at a time. Thank you, Janice. Yeah, yeah, you know, just a tiny bit. You don't want to thin your glaze too much. Then you end up with a watery glaze. Smoky Merlot over birch. Oh, I don't know if I have birch. Mm. So now we're gonna wipe back the actual center. And I'm just, you see I'm turning my sponge as I wipe. And then dip it in the water. Now I'm gonna fold it up and I'm just gonna go in and because these are so raised, it's such high relief, right? We can use the tip of the sponge to wipe a bit of it back to start. Staining can also be a way to create an antique look. So if you have a piece and you wanna make it look more vintage, you can stain it a uh, black stain is a good way to start. You could do a brown. Check out Georgie's Interactive Pigments. The only drawback with Georgie's is, and the reason I didn't use it on this, is they're not considered food safe by the manufacturer because they're so high in oxides. Now, I have used them on plates before but I thin them way down and wipe back a lot. And I know they're fairly safe, but it's not guaranteed and they're not on pieces I sell. So I would not recommend you use it for food wear unless you have it tested by a lab. And then if they say it's good, you're good. Are all Mako stoneware glazes stable or some of them run? Uh, Nancy, they do have runners, and it just depends on the actual glaze and how thick your application is and how high you fire them. Yeah. Um, now... One of our Mako demos is going to be working with their stoneware glazes. Oh, so for ClayshareCon, Mako's coming on board. They're doing, Mako's doing three demos with us. GR Pottery Forms, is Jeff doing four or five demos? I'm doing four. Michael Harbridge is doing four or five. Paula McCoy is doing two. Uh, Speedball is going to come for a factory tour and Q&A session, and I'll be doing some demos with Speedball. Diamond Core Tools, I'll be doing some carving and using their handheld extruders, some Mishima and Scrafito for, for their demo. They don't have anybody that does demos, so I'll be using their products since I've been using them for a while. So it's going to be... A lot. Uh, Flexi Bats is going to be joining us again this year, and Chelsea's going to be doing a demo with her awesome Flexi Bats. We love Chelsea's Flexi Bats. I don't have the schedule in front of me. You guys need to go just get it. Um, Adam Field's going to be popping in and giving us a little quick studio tour and talking about, you know, his studio practices and things, and also the fact he's got 
a workshop with us. You know, he did one last year, and now he's doing this one. So he'll be a fun visit. We are going to have studio tours. Some of our members have been sending videos in, and we're going to have a little block of time dedicated to them. So you can see other people's studios, which I always love to see how people, you know, work and how their space is laid out. All right, so I think this is pretty good. You can see the words and everything. Now, we're going to use a glaze that can be kind of tricky, and a lot of the glazes from Laguna tend to be chalky. They tend to be a little difficult for spreading. Um, they're a glaze that I think will really benefit from my mixer because they need a good stirring. Whoop! There it goes. It's like making a smoothie, but not the smoothie you want to drink. Oh, I had a great question about safely disposing dirty glaze water. Well, we don't use any toxic glazes. Like all of the glazes I use in my studio are food safe. So that's one part of it. Um, the other is, because I don't have running water in my studio, I do not pour them down the sink. And all you need to do is let, I pour the liquid off, the, the water once it's separated off, and then the, sol the solids you just scrape out and um, you can just dispose of them. You can check with your town and make sure they're okay with it. I would, but um, really the dry materials that are left, when they're more of a sludge state, you just scrape it into a little um, box or something you're throwing away. I don't know, little whatever you're, you're doing. Usually, I don't have much sludge. Now I do know some people will scrape their sludges all together and I have done this with my dip and pour glazes. I save all of my glaze sludge into a bucket and I make a, I call it the magical mystery glaze. And I glaze pots with them. And it's sometimes really interesting, but you'll never get the same glaze twice. So if you do that, just know you're never going to replicate that. Once you get a bucket of it going, uh, that's, that's a one and done. But it's very fun to do. I'm interested to hear how does everybody dispose of their glaze water. It's always a thing. <laughs> Torian said, ex exactly, we're on the same page. Make a whole new glaze <laughs> with your sludge. Uh, did Flexibacks get the hands reversed for the Clayshare logo? They are backwards on my Flexibat, and they've not been changed. Yeah, but it's all right, you know. So let's stir this up. I had to add water to it. It was way thick. And I might add a little more water than I planned, so it's a little thin. What do we do? Everybody, just add another layer. Okay, let's start with the back. And we're just gonna brush this on. Now the Laguna glazes, they dry really fast. They have less flowability than everybody else's that I've been using, I've found. So um, a lot of people struggle with them because they tend to go what's called chalky. You know, because you'll be going along and see you want this nice smooth flow, but then it's just not blending well. So I thinned mine down maybe a little on the thin side, but I honestly think it works better. So what you do is you do, instead of three coats, you do four coats as opposed to three thicker coats for thin coats. You have a bucket that you rinse out outside with the hose in the spring. Yeah, and that's because I don't have running water. Often we'll just do that. Stay 300 feet from all wells though, right? That's the safety standard. All right, so we're going to get the edge. And that was almost two coats, right? That's basically two coats. You see how quickly this is drying, though. And we're going to let it dry, and then we're going to come back to it 
and we're going to put at least one, maybe two more coats. And again, this is the Laguna MS95 Peacock. Laguna makes two uh, peacocks. One is for flat pieces, one is for vertical pieces. The flat one, if you put it on a vertical piece, it'll melt like crazy. This is the one for vertical pieces. You can use it on flat. So the vertical one, the MS95, you can use on flat and vertical pieces. The one that's for the flat pieces, if you put it on a vertical, and I don't know why they have two called the same. They should have named it something different um, because you don't really need to. But if you put it on a vertical piece, the one for flat pieces, it runs like mad. Okay, so we are at the end, but I'm going to... I'm going to flux quickly, quickly. We're going to do the edge. And I, I would like another coat of the Laguna Peacock, but you know, can't always get what you want in life. So we're not going to, I'm not going to get that. I'm just going to go ahead with the flux. This is Mako Light Flux. And I believe, does it just say flux on the jar? It just says Mako Flux. I call it light flux because they have a dark flux. So this is the not dark flux. And we're just going to put a band. This stuff does flux like crazy. It runs. It's a glaze. So those who wonder what the flux is. What the flux? The flux. What the flux? Yes, it's flux. It's a glaze. And it melts a lot. And does some cool stuff. So we're fluxing. Okay, so that's what we did tonight. We glazed uh, three, four, four. That's a record. I glazed four plates in a broadcast. Usually I don't get that far in. I did go over time a little bit. Uh, basically two coats of flux is what I would do. First coat wider, second coat just a band at the very edge, and that's it. It's done, and then it goes in the kiln. Now, for prime time next, what are we doing? Well, we're going to do peacock glazing. So here's a little bowl I have that I did the peacock glazing in. You can see that there. I've got some trays behind me. Let me grab this one. From my tray with built-in handles class, the main class has peacock glazing in it. Everybody who's looking for that class, it's in the handle class. It's a big two-parter. So you get how to glaze and how to make. You don't want to know how to make it. Just skip straight through that part to the glazing part, and you can see how I applied the glazes on this for that peacock effect. But we're going to be glazing some pieces next, uh, and I'm going to do this combo, which is some Mako glazes, and, and maybe we'll do some others. We'll see. I, I don't know what will happen. It's alive. Crazy things can happen all the time. All right, everyone. Remember, two weeks till ClayshareCon. Mark your calendar. Go to ClayshareResources.com or ClayshareCon.com to see the schedule. And uh, I will see everybody who's prime time next, and everybody else, I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.